If you take a look at NASA's budget breakdown, you won't be surprised to find companies like SpaceX, Lockheed Martin, and Boeing near the top of the payout list. But surprisingly, the number one spot doesn't go to any of these space companies. The largest portion of NASA's funding actually goes to the California Institute of Technology. In fact, in the fiscal year of 2020, Caltech received a total of $2.8 billion from NASA, which is over twice the amount second place received. This isn't a new phenomenon either. In 2021, so far, they have received $1.3 billion. In 2019, Caltech received $3.6 billion. In 2018, Caltech received $2.7 billion. And this same pattern can be traced back for decades. Every single year, Caltech receives about 10-15% to of NASA's entire budget. So why does NASA pay Caltech billions every year? Well, the strong link between NASA and Caltech today dates all the way back to the 1930s. In the 1930s, Caltech was a relatively new university with only about 40 years of history. But despite their relative youth, Caltech was already starting to receive worldwide recognition for their brilliant alumni. Caltech didn't hand out its first doctoral degree till 1920, but just three years later in 1923, Robert A. Millikan would become Caltech's first Nobel laureate winner. Such impressive feats for such a young university attracted some of the best professors in the world to teach at Caltech. Even Albert Einstein would periodically teach at Caltech throughout the early 1930s. Considering the intelligence of Caltech students and professors at the time, it's not surprising that in the 1930s, one of their professors, Theodore von Karman, started to work on rocket propulsion. Professor Karman didn't have the smoothest of starts though. The tests he conducted initially were not only inherently dangerous, but would often fail making it even more dangerous. So, in order to avoid endangering students and the public living near the college, Professor Karman and several graduate students would move their operation to a dry canyon near Pasadena, California. The group's first test in the new location would take place on October 31st, 1936, and this date would eventually be known as the day the Jet Propulsion Laboratory was founded. The group initially focused on alcohol-powered rocket motors, and as they started to make progress with their motors, Professor Carmen would decide to expand the scope of the program. Around this time, World War II had just begun, and though the US hadn't officially entered the war, they were quite involved in supplying allies like Great Britain. Noticing this, Professor Carmen would talk with the US Army Air Corps, and he would be successful in persuading the Army to fund their little research team. The Army would help the team acquire a piece of land in the canyon, and they would give them access to a few air bases for testing purposes. The idea was that the motors the group was developing could be used in conjunction with military jets to allow for takeoffs from super short runways. As development and implementation of their motors continued throughout the early 1940s, the US Army would task the team with a new project that was much more important. In 1943, the Army would request that the team look into the German V-2 rocket program. As a result, the team would put together a detailed plan slash funding request and they would submit it to the US Army. This proposal would be the first time that the team referred to themselves as the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. The request would be approved and JPL would develop and launch various missiles throughout the rest of the 1940s and early 1950s. The main result of their work throughout these years was autonomous missile technology. Anyways, as World War II came to a close and tensions simmered down, a new war would start up, which was of course the Cold War. In 1954, JPL would approach the US Army requesting permission to team up with them on an upcoming satellite launch. Unfortunately, this request would be denied. However, JPL would be allowed to work on a classified project relating to nuclear warhead reentry. JPL would end up flying three suborbital missions between 1956 and 1957, which proved that warheads could be safely recovered from space. Meanwhile, the Navy would attempt to launch a rocket called Vanguard in December of 1957. The rocket would barely leave the ground before it fell back and exploded. Considering this tremendous failure, JPL and the Army would be allowed to try the following month. And on January 31st, 1958, JPL and the Army would successfully launch Explorer 1, which would become the first successful satellite launch by the US. Given this massive success and increasing pressure from the Soviet Union, the US would decide to form a space agency. On October 1st, 1958, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, would be founded. And just two months later, on December 3rd, 1958, JPL would be transferred from the Army to NASA. So why does NASA pay Caltech billions every year? Well, JPL was basically the foundation of NASA. They give NASA substantial knowledge in terms of solid and liquid rocket propulsion systems, guidance systems, 
telecommunication systems, testing facilities, and much, much more. But all of that was just the prologue. The partnership between NASA and JPL was just getting started. Throughout the 1960s, JPL would shift away from developing rockets and into developing robotic spacecrafts. The first two projects JPL would accomplish with NASA were the Ranger and Surveyor missions. Both of these projects were focused on photographing the lunar surface. Ranger 7, 8, and 9 were launched in 1964 and 1965. These robots were designed to take pictures of the moon as it descended to the lunar surface and destroyed themselves. Following these missions, we would see the launch of Surveyor 1, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Unlike the Ranger missions, these robots could safely land on the lunar surface and continue to take pictures. Moving on, JPL would start to turn their focus to other planets in the 1970s. They would complete Mariner missions to Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Mariner missions were flyby missions that took pictures of the various planets as they passed them or orbited them. After the Mariner missions, JPL would start work on arguably their most iconic project, which was of course, the Voyager missions. Voyager 1 and 2 are a pair of spacecraft that were launched in 1977 and 1978. Since then, the pair have just continued to venture deeper and deeper into space. In fact, in August of 2012, Voyager 1 would become the first spacecraft to enter interstellar space. Voyager 2 would also hit this milestone in November of 2018. It's crazy to think that these spacecrafts were designed and launched nearly 50 years ago at this point. NASA estimates that we should continue receiving images and data from the pair till 2025. Despite their solid progress with these spacecrafts, as we enter the 1980s, public interest in space started to decline. As a result, NASA's budget would start getting cut, which would consequentially lead to cuts in JPL's budget as well. Due to the budget cuts, JPL would scale back from space missions for a little bit and focus on solar and battery technology. However, nothing too significant would come out of this endeavor, and JPL would face a massive problem at the start of the 1980s. Given the stark decline in the interest for planetary exploration, Congress would actually consider shutting down JPL in September of 1981. This is actually super ironic. One of the key reasons for NASA's rapid success in the space industry is JPL. But now that the US had won the space race, Congress wanted to shut down JPL. Honestly, that's kind of messed up. Fortunately though, Caltech trustees as well as the scientific community would rally behind JPL and protest the closure. And thankfully, Congress would not only listen, but they would go ahead and fund new planetary missions as well. This would allow JPL and NASA to complete the Magellan Raider mission to Venus and the Galileo space probe mission by the end of the 1980s. The next major phase for JPL would be Martian rovers. JPL would work on developing a pair of Martian rovers throughout the 1990s called the Spirit and the Opportunity. The Spirit rover would end up being launched in June of 2003 and it would successfully reach Mars. The rover collected data and took pictures till May of 2009 when a couple of its wheels got stuck in the Martian sand. NASA would attempt to rescue the rover for two years, but with no significant progress, NASA would end effort in May of 2011. Meanwhile, the Opportunity rover was launched just one month after the Spirit rover in July of 2003. Opportunity would reach Mars in 2004 and it would communicate with NASA all the way till June of 2018. At the time, a Martian dust storm would cut off communication between the rover and NASA. Anyways, after Opportunity, NASA and JPL would of course launch a Curiosity rover in 2011, which is still operational to this day. And more recently, NASA and JPL just landed the Perseverance rover on Mars in February. Looking forward, JPL has a handful of missions that they are working on right now. For instance, the Mars helicopter mission took flight just last month. They've also got the Near-Earth Asteroid Scout mission occurring in November of 2021, the Astros mission occurring in 2023, and Sphere-X occurring in 2024. At the end of the day, this was just a gloss over of the most important contributions of JPL to NASA. JPL has worked on countless more missions like the Viking and Europa missions. but. I think the missions covered in this video provide a solid view as to why Caltech and JPL have been so integral to NASA over the past few decades, and why NASA continues to fork over billions of dollars to Caltech on an annual basis. Did you guys realize that Caltech played such a big role in NASA? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you guys think JPL is underrated and deserves more credit. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.